Charlie Parsons for Boxing Social and Association with William Hill and Empire Fight Store. Delighted to be joined here in London today. Mr. Andy Clark, we're here at the box off uh, sort of launch press conference, bit of a presentation for them today. Uh, I suppose just firstly speaking about that, it's a new concept, almost like a, a tournament style thing with uh, captains of each team, I believe starting off with Birmingham, London, Leeds and Manchester. We saw Tom Skinner here today, JK here today. Do you want to give us a little bit of a sort of introduction as to what this is? So it's a team event and boxing hasn't really had a team event that I can think of in pro boxing, certainly not in the time that I've been doing it. I remember covering World Series boxing in the amateurs, which ran for nearly 10 years and finished two or three years ago. And that was country based. And it was the same kind of format where you would have five fights. Uh, those were over five rounds and it was a kind of league system. And that was really popular. I think people really got behind that. So they've looked at it and felt like there's a space to have this kind of team event. And it was put to me a few weeks ago and what really appealed to me about it, what really appeals to me about it basically is the fact that they're trying to attract fighters and give chances to fighters who ordinarily might not get one. But it is the four cities, like you say. So there'll be two semi-finals, five fights in each semi-final, over four rounds. The British Boxing Board of Control are backing it, absolutely. Um, they, they like the idea of it. So everything is sanctioned and above board and totally legit. And the winners of the semi-finals will go through to the, to the final. The semi-finals are at the Telford International Centre on September the 16th. There's bonuses to be factored in for knockouts and if the team wins and, and things like that. And all the usual provisions whereby if somebody if a team gets through but one of their fighters gets injured or whatever it is, you know, there'll be standbys and things will be catered for. Uh, we won't ever end up with a draw. You know, I think we're looking at how best to do that, whether it's a fourth judge or whether the referee gives a casting vote or it was stuff like this we've seen before in Prize Fighter and, and the World Boxing Super Series. So there are little things you need to sort out. But generally speaking, it's the simplicity of it, I think, really, that people will enjoy. And, and the four cities, I don't think it'll be a struggle to get to get hopefully some decent numbers to the to the first one and the team captains you mentioned there you know they've got their own gyms Tom Skinner and JK uh, JK with the McCrackens in Birmingham Tom in Brentwood they're invested in the sport they put their time into the sport and it's not because they want any money out of it they make their money elsewhere it's because they're into it and yeah I mean I'm just really interested to see how it goes because I think there is a space for it because we all know that there are plenty of fighters out there who, if you can't sell tickets and you don't have that big reputation from the amateurs, then it can be very, very difficult. Getting fights can be really, really tricky, borderline in, impossible. And, and either they head for the away corner and have to kind of park their ambition a bit or they, or they just stop boxing. You know, and it happens to a lot of people. How sort of important is it for, they mentioned there there's a few teething things, it's going to be something that's going to be developed, but to get the ball running, we know that there was so much demand for the sort of prize fighter type thing, but when outlets are able to sort of make themselves as a promotional company, it sort of maybe gets pushed to one side. How important is it for fans and the value that something like this is here to stay? Because whenever we do get sort of your ultimate boxer series or what prize fighter was, it was quite engaging. Also a good way for casuals to tune in. They don't really need to know who's fighting. They get the concept, people go in with each other and they get to see people that they know away from the sport as well. Yeah, I, I, th I think... I think it is how simple it is, is one of the best things about it. Because I remember talking to people about, about World Series boxing that I mentioned, and it, it, it was mad really because IBA, the international governing body um, for amateur boxing, it was almost like they were trying to keep it a secret. It never really got the push that it needed because the standard of boxing was unbelievable. But what was so good about it? It wasn't just that you get these guys who would then box in the World Championships in the Olympics. It was that everyone was evenly matched and everybody came to win or as evenly matched as you could be. And, and in that competition, for example, a half and half record was a good record. Like everybody got beat in that, you know, even the top guys, everybody at some point would get beat. And if you had six fights in that and you came out of it three and three, then that was a good return. And that's the kind of landscape that we're looking for in this, basically, that people are prepared to roll the dice, take that gamble have a hard fight we saw it a bit in covid you know with fight camp and no easy fights and stuff like that but then the practicalities of promoting um if you're a big tv promoter they, they inevitably get in the way and i said at the, at the um when i was standing up there 
did, we're not criticising anything that anybody else is doing. We, we completely understand why it's really difficult for small hall promoters to put too many non-ticket sellers in a home corner. They do their best with it, you know, to try and give fighters that opportunity and give them that push, but they can't do too much of it or they go bankrupt. Um, and for TV, you've got prospects you have to build, the, the, the Olympians that you've signed, you know, you have to move their career on. So through no fault of anybody's really, just through the, the nature of the business, these are the fighters who, who get lost. Um, and I think it is easy for people to get behind it. The City thing is a good idea because there's a lot of big boxing hubs in, in the UK and there's plenty of others besides the four that, that we've chosen for this. So the dream is really that this goes really well. Everybody really enjoys it. Um, and then double the amount of teams for next year. But, but what I've really liked about it from the beginning, we talked to people involved in it, um, is they're, they're sensible, you know, they're, they're realistic. They're not trying to run before they can walk. They're not, you know, making promises they maybe can't keep. They're just, they pushed it out here today, invited a few people down, hopefully word will spread. Um, they're investing in it, you know, they're speculating to an extent because they believe in it. Let me ask you, world of boxing as a whole, next week we have Anthony Joshua and Dillian White too. It was sort of um denied if it was still a big fight, but I think anything AJ involved and especially White off the back of that first fight shows how big it is. Um, excited and is Dillian White maybe the person to bring out the old AJ or, or do we think now with Derek James at tutelage he's going to be more keep it long and sort of box sensible? That, that's a really interesting question about it really because I felt like when he boxed Jermaine Franklin he won comfortably and it was nice and tidy the performance but he didn't really need to get out of second or third gear to be perfectly honest and what we do what we feel like we need to know with him is whether he's still got it in the locker to roll that dice when he needs to because in heavyweight boxing almost all of the time if you're going to win a big fight you have to be prepared to take that risk because if you're going to try and knock somebody out and that's basically what they're all doing you leave yourself a greater risk of being knocked out. If you're going to take yourself into that punching range, then you're within that punching range to be hit. I feel like if he's going to beat somebody like Wilder or Fury, I don't see him revisiting Usyk, but some of these other younger guys on the way up maybe. If he's going to do that, then he has to be prepared to, he has to, be prepared to, to take that chance, to commit to that to that mentality and it, it, it is a mentality if you talk to any boxing trainer they'll tell you basically that if somebody's got the right amount of athleticism you can teach them to punch hard they can knock somebody out at professional level anybody can get caught by that one punch they don't see and get their lights turned out a anybody can anybody can do that they've, they've all got that that capability and you have to commit to that as being almost a possibility. When you're on the way to the ring, of course, you deny it as a possibility. But it, it is a mentality when you get to that elite level. He didn't really look like he wanted to pull that trigger against Franklin, but then he didn't really need to. So he didn't really learn an awful lot in that fight, I didn't feel. If Dillian can force that out of him, then it will be really interesting to see whether it's still there or not. Whether he can or not, I don't really know because you look at that performance against Fury, it's, it's a long time ago now, and then against Franklin. If he's missing a step, Dillian, which he's not going to get back at the age he is, then he might not be capable of forcing that out of Anthony, in which case he'll probably be able to win the fight doing it the way he did against Jermaine Franklin without taking any unnecessary risks. What I'm really hoping for is, is a contest where he does have to set his feet and he does have to roll that dice. Two more on the world of boxing. Uh, a month away today, Smith Eubank too. Um, on that, Eubank has changed trainer out in Vegas still. Um, no longer with Roy Jones Jr. What do you make of that? Um, spoke to Caller last week. He said he's going to be doing a lot of things differently. Not coming at a 159 for a start. That pound makes a big difference. Uh, didn't give me any hints training wise but the broad boxing perspective is it's going to be quite a step for Eubank to do it in the way that the first fight went do you think the changes are right 
Is there a way he can do it? We know he's stubborn. And... Yeah, he's kind of fascinating, Eubank, because he's he's flitted around from trainer to trainer over the years. And I saw Roy Jones actually in Thailand a couple of weeks ago at, uh, at an Iber event. And I was asking him about the rematch. At that point, it hadn't been announced. And I just kind of stopped him on the way out and, and just asked him, you know, so is he going to sign Chris? And he said, well, it's nothing to do with me anymore. I'm not I'm not training him. And he was, he was, he was totally zen about it. There was no kind of issue there that I could identify. There was no... You know, he wasn't prickly about it. What he said is that their schedules didn't really permit it. But we do know that Chris jumps around training-wise quite a lot. I don't think that's ever really been a good thing for him, to be honest, because I think everybody needs that person who they really listen to and they really trust. And when you look at that first fight, it was interesting because Roy did sort of say in the aftermath, didn't he, that the way Eubank went about it was not what he advised. He advised him, look, the way to fight this fight is to fight the way that you used to fight. The interesting thing about that is that we hadn't really seen that for a while because he had that strange fight against Korobov, which ended early. And then we saw him look to box a bit more when he was in with Marcus Morrison, for example. Uh, and like everybody during COVID, he didn't box as much as he would have wanted to. So that old Eubank, the come forward, throw bundles of punches, really solid chin, or so it seems, incredible engine. We haven't seen him for a bit. I do feel like that's what he should try and do, but it is a big, it's a big gap to bridge after what happened in the first fight because, particularly when you are someone who's always had that reputation of, of being, you know, very solid around the whiskers. When when you get stopped in the way that he did, that's going to put doubt into anybody's mind. Maybe he didn't do the weight right. Maybe that was a slight issue. Maybe there were things going on behind the scenes that we don't really know about. We'll find out on the second. But this is a massive, massive test for him because. Like I say, when you kind of trade off that tough guy persona, that that kind of a loss, getting stopped for the first time, mentally that takes some coming back from. Two things on that. Um, I think him and Connor had more back and forth the other day on social media. Um, Eubank saying that he'd put Connor to sleep. Obviously, with Connor's UCAD suspension being lifted, uh, if Eubank loses, does that? put an end to the Ben fight ever and what are your thoughts on the whole Ben thing people talking at the minute that maybe not quite clear just a suspension lifted what, what, what sort of on those two things yeah I mean it's it, it, it is difficult that whole thing with regard to Eubank Ben I feel like that fight would be there even if Chris lost I, I just think it would be I just think it would be an easy sell um, interest in it the first time was big I think now it would be it would be bigger um, so I don't feel like that would necessarily derail that. I mean, it would be better for Eubank, obviously, if he won, and it would be better for the fight generally, Eubank, Ben, if, if Eubank came into off the back of a win. With regard to Connor's situation, I still don't feel like it's completely clear because the British Boxing Board of Control put out a statement, I think, yesterday, which I'd imagine was all that they could say, but it didn't really clarify anything. The UCAD statement... You could say the same thing about that. So it, it makes me feel like all of that red tape, if you like, for want of a better phrase, isn't quite over yet, but I don't really know what still has to happen. It's been one of those scenarios right from the beginning where solid facts and things that we definitely know have been scarce. And that's been the problem. And I've never, not really talked about it at any point because I just felt like you had to wait for everything to come out. You have to wait for everybody to get their opportunity to say what they want to say and try and prove what they need to prove. And I just don't quite know if we're there yet. As a boxing fan, what I've always wanted would be for Conor Ben to be able to demonstrate that although this substance did find its way into his system because it did you know that's that's not in dispute it did to be able to demonstrate that it was unintentional and to be able to provide some evidence or whatever of, of how it got there um, that's what I've always wanted from it to be honest with you um, and I hope that's what we get but I just feel like it's maybe not quite it's maybe not quite finished or finalised yet. 
Excuse me. Andy, thank you very much for your time. Obviously, we look forward to the launch of the box off, uh, the inaugural show coming up in Telford.